Welcome to another Hutchin Hunting Podcast with your host, Bruce Hutchin. And I'm heading out to Michigan and I'm gonna we're gonna chat with Ken Dalton, Mr. Fezident. Not president, but Fezident. And there's a big story behind that. And we're gonna unpack that as we uh talk with Ken today. So Ken, give me the backstory about how you became Mr. Fezident in the state of Michigan. Okay, the way I became Mr. Pheasant in the state of Michigan, I had a longing to hunt pheasants again in Michigan when I was an avid pheasant hunter, and I hung up my gun and got rid of my bird dog for over 30 years. I heard that the 21 other states had pheasant release programs, and I, I grabbed onto that information that I found out, and through, through that, I, I started the Michigan Pheasant Hunting Initiative, but prior to that, I didn't know what to call the name of the organization, so I had a poster made up, have you seen this bird? Because I was uh, in a Field and Stream magazine, they had an article, it was so bad pheasant hunting, believe it or not, in Iowa, they, they had posters on telephone poles, have you seen this bird with a phone number that you could call in if you did actually see a bird? And it sparked my uh, interest and I started working on this program. And it, it brings to mind to me that when Moses and God, how he provided manna and, and food when they was when they was starving to death in the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. And God provided quail. He provided a meal for them to have food to eat. And, and I, I felt that God could provide pheasants for, for the Michigan pheasant hunters if I if I had the faith of the grain of a mustard seed. And, and I trusted God for the whole thing. And he made it happen. Um, he told me that he opened a door that no man could close and truly no doors have been closed. And we've moved forward since, since the beginning in 2017. So 2017, you started this and you had mm -hmm. to go all the way to the governor to get approval from the DNR. You know, he had to sign off on it and yes. tell us about that. Tell us about that journey. Okay, that journey was a long, grueling journey, and we and we we wore a lot of uh, rubber off the tires going back and forth to meetings all over the state of Michigan, and we went, <clears throat> and we actually was blessed by the legislators. They they coughed up two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to start the program the first year, and it was basically unheard of anywhere in the United States. And when we had this this money in our hands, we we started the first peasant release program in Michigan since the. Uh, uh, late seventies, we had a put and take program, but it, it, uh, it failed. And I saw that, um, uh, they had pheasants, those other pheasant release programs that were very successful to the point that Pennsylvania raises and releases 250,000 pheasants a year and sells 50,000 pheasant licenses, Wisconsin, 70,000 pheasants released a year. And they sell unbelievable amount of pheasant license with 200 release sites. I thought, why can't we do this? And, and, and we, we just kept beating the drums. We had Michigan United Conservation Club get on board with 40,000 members and they supported our resolution and it, and it got passed and it went all the way to the governor and they signed it into law that we now have a pheasant release program in Michigan and a pheasant license that you can buy to hunt birds. So run by um, the numbers because this podcast goes throughout North America. Okay. And so talk about the numbers. So why did the uh, legislation pony up with $450,000 because state governments just don't give money away? So how did, how did that all pencil out for selling licenses and releasing birds, raising birds? How does it all pencil out? Well, it all penciled out like this. Um, I had a friend of mine, his, and it was $250,000, not four fifty, two fifty. Okay. My my friend David Grubbs, he's a, he's passed now, but he was a world famous bird dog trainer. He won more field trials than anybody in U.S. history, and a very intelligent man. Could have had any job he wanted in his life, but he chose to train bird dogs and hunt birds because he loved it so much, and he did it for fifty years. He told me, if you ever want to get anything done to start a pheasant release program in Michigan, you have to contact your legislators, or it will never happen. And when he told me that, I took him very serious. And I became a well-known uh, in Lansing. I met all the legislators and senators and by name. And they they liked what I was saying because they love pheasant hunting too. And our pheasant hunting is so bad, they wanted to see a change. 
there's a time in Michigan in the 40s and 50s when we harvested 1,450,000 pheasants a year. They shut down schools. They shut down jobs. People didn't go to work. The highways was packed with hunters. And now it's not even mentioned anymore because we have such a low population. So the legislators liked what I was doing and everybody came on board and supported it and passed the resolutions that we kept going back with and it just worked out beautiful. So how much does a hunting license cost? Oh, okay, the hunting license. And then, by the way, this we we get we receive no money from the DNR. This this uh, program is funded by hunters' dollars, and it's a twenty five dollar pheasant license that you get at the online or at the at the stores. And under under uh, seven, under eighteen, it's free for the youth, so they can go hunting with their parents without breaking the bank and get everybody back out in the fields hunting again. So the money is protected by law in a sub account by law for exclusive release of rooster pheasants on public land only that the money can't be taken to be used for any other reason. And how many hunters buy a license in Michigan? Well, last year, last year we were, there was approximately uh, close to 13,000 licenses issued. Okay. And, and, and it's growing. It's growing. We, we were working on having a better advertising uh, campaign to let more people be aware of, of what's available for hunters in Michigan now. And the good thing about it is you go to public land hunting. You don't have to knock on a door and, and be told no. And you can go pheasant hunting in October, from October 20th to November 14th. And from December 1st to January 1st, any day of the week you want to go, morning, noon or night. And and you don't and you can just go out there and enjoy pheasant hunting like the old days. And okay, there, there's so birds there. I'm going to round it off. Ten thousand times twenty five bucks is a quarter million dollars a year mm -hmm. that's coming in. So that covers the raising of the pheasants and the releasing of those pheasants. Oh yes. Well, there's some. There's a few licenses in there that people have lifetime licenses that they bought, so they don't have to pay, and uh, and uh, some military licenses also that come out of that. But we still. Uh, are bringing in a good chunk of change. And the, what what the, what they do with the money is uh, we hired the private game bird breeders to raise the pheasants for the state of Michigan. And then they released the pheasants uh, on unknown release dates after shooting hours. And they do that twice a week, October, November, and December, minus deer season from the 15th to the 30th. And that, that way you go out there pheasant hunting and uh, and you don't even know what day the birds were put out there. And uh, it's just as close as you can get to a real pheasant hunt. And the game bird breeders are doing a fantastic job raising these birds. Um, very long tail feathers, very, very witty, uh, very flight driven, hard to knock down. And uh, the, I, my one friend, Jack Ammerman, he was uh, hunting the panko unit up by uh, Saginaw. Zuwaki Bridge, the last day of season, thought maybe he wouldn't see a bird, and he saw an older gentleman coming out of the field with tail feathers sticking out of his uh, jacket, and Jack even actually saw a bird the last day of pheasant season, that's the last part of December. So there are birds out there that survive, contrary to what people say, that they're so dumb that they might last two or three days and they're gone. That That's not true. These, I these agree. Birds, yeah. Because I'm one of these guys that went on public land, with my Springer Spaniel, Alex, mm -hmm. and I hunted public land throughout the fall. And Alex would always find the pheasants. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're hearing me, folks, if you expect just to go out and drive the fields and post the fields and hunt pheasants that way, you'll be successful. But it's so much more fun when you have a good working dog with you and you can go out and I'll challenge anybody not to find pheasants on public ground with a good working dog. And I don't, it doesn't matter when the pheasants were released, the pheasants are there because it's just like a big buck. They got smart fast. They learn to hold. So you almost have to step on them to bust them. I mean, it's really fun. But I personally would not hunt pheasants without a working dog. Your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that, 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 that is an unbelievable way of hunting uh, with a dog. Uh, 
when I was uh, 15, 16 years old, I grew up in Pontiac, Michigan. As Ted Nugent said, on the, in a the concrete jungle. I, I had no hopes of ever being a hunter till one day I was walking up Chandler Hill. I saw this individual on the other side of a, a Facizia fence row swinging something around. I'm just staring at him in amazement. And he, he spotted me. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm training a bird dog. You want to come and watch? That day I was introduced to pheasant hunting and it lit a fire in me. I couldn't even sleep at night after that. My one 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 morning of getting ready to go pheasant hunting, my mom made me a lunch. I had a shotgun, a Winchester Model 12 pump, 30 inch full choke. Um, at two o'clock in the morning, I'm up eating breakfast. I'm getting my <laughs> lunch ready to go out the door. My mom said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm leaving to go hunting. It's time to go. She says, you're not leaving until 4.30 in the morning and you're already up to leave. <laughs> I got so excited. I didn't look at that clock. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I, I, I just stress this issue that hunters should be concerned about the future of hunting in, in any state in the United States. Take some young person, some man, some woman under your wing and introduce them to pheasant hunting. Because I say pheasant hunting is the gateway to all hunting. Small game hunting is the gateway to all hunting. Um, you don't just instantly be hunting grizzly bears and rhinoceroses and elk and deer. Small game hunting, you get introduced to small game hunting and then you progress right on up to being whatever kind of hunter that you want. And, and we've lost in Michigan over 50% of our small game hunters in 10 years. And that's a staggering number of people to lose. But the fez, rooster pheasant, he can bring back excitement to hunting and restore large numbers of hunters back into our state, in which, which it's being shown to happen. And an example is South Dakota. They release a staggering amount of pheasants out there. And they have more hunters coming to South Dakota from Michigan that doesn't touch the borders of South Dakota than any state in the United States. We have more hunters. They go out there for three, four days, spend three, four thousand dollars and come home to nothing. Now they can come home and hunt 13 state game areas that are stocked with pheasants during our pheasant season and have hopes of shooting and harvesting some more birds and, and bringing more people back out into the fields. And one thing, and I've I've shot in North Dakota and South Dakota and Nebraska. I haven't shot Kansas. But anyway, I like to go because I go with a crew of guys, and I know I'll see hundreds of pheasants. Mm -hmm. You know, just not ones or twos or whatever. I was on the Missouri River one time, and they were working hedgerows, and I was just at the end. I was the blocker. And I just stood there and pheasant after pheasant after pheasant <laughs> went over my head. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you only have, I don't know what the limit was back then. Let's say it's three birds or five birds. You know, I could have been done in five or 10 minutes. I could have, my whole hunt was over and I didn't want that. I wanted to stay afield and enjoy, you know, just enjoy what the heck was going on. Mm -hmm. but, but it's amazing when you get into those states that do have large populations. It's just, you know, it, it's just amazing to see that many birds, you know, get up at the end of a drive. And well, you'll never, for, you'll never forget it. Yeah, you just don't. And up there, we hunt with dogs, but we also put out blockers because we're hunting large uh, CRPs and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's every once in a while I'll get invited to go to a game preserve and I almost don't want to go because it's it's really kind of boring. Right. <laughs> it is, but it's good, you know, it's it's good to get out, get my kids out, and um but it's not the same as hunting, you know, wild birds, that's for sure. Well, uh, back in uh, back in the um all the late 70s, early 80s, uh, we hunted Cape Peck, Michigan. And I, there was days when I would see uh, 50 birds, 30 birds, 100 birds. But uh, nowadays, it's a, a, a problem across the whole United States is uh, brutal agriculture practices. Um, the, the habitat that we love is being wiped off the landscape at an alarming rate. And it, when that happens, you lose uh, large populations of pheasants because they need a place to live also. Um, it's just, that's just how bad it is. But 
you'd be surprised at how many states actually release pheasants. It, Wyoming even releases pheasants. Um, New Jersey, look, they can Google it on their phone, states that release pheasants, and you can find every one of them. And it will blow your mind how many people do this. And that's why I jumped on board. And because of that, one thing is we're not trying to repopulate the pheasant population in Michigan. We're a recruitment organization. It's called Recruitment Retention Reactivation. And that's what we're doing. We're the bringing three hunters, R's. Three R's. We're bringing hunters back to the fields. When we're in these parking lots with these hunters, you it's like a tailgate party. People have lunches, they have food. They wanna show you their pheasants and every, everybody knows what a pheasant looks like out there, but they're just so proud of their pheasant that they harvested and that they're gonna take it home and have a delicious meal on the table, but nobody wants to leave the parking lot. They're just savoring the moment. Prior to this Michigan Pheasant Hunting Initiative being launched, the parking lots where these places was taking place looked like ghost towns. There was zero cars there. And now the parking lots are piled with hunters. There's a place called Rose Lake uh, State Game Area. Last uh, year on opening day, there was, a, um, I think it was 170 cars there, <laughs> trucks <laughs> to, to hunt these birds. And you know what I said? Praise the Lord. I wish there was a thousand cars there because that would show our Department of Natural Resources is this how bad people want to hunt pheasants in Michigan. Right. I say the more the better. You might bump into somebody a couple of times, but just be thankful you got some birds to hunt. Yeah, and that's the way I get. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, what about pheasants forever? Do you work with those folks at all? Um, not right now. Um, they're they're a habitat organization, and when I initially launched this program, I saw pheasants forever and MPHI walking down the road hand in hand, but uh, they. Uh, some of the individuals, but the, the basically the membership base strongly supports Michigan Pheasant Hunting Initiative because they do want to hunt pheasants. We've been doing habitat work for 40 years in Michigan and still don't have a huntable population of pheasants. So at that time, I thought something needs to change. And, and Michigan Pheasant Hunting Initiative strongly supports habitat because we know that's the key to all wildlife populations. And I'm working with some people right now, some new blood that's in Pheasants Forever in Michigan. And hopefully there'll be a change in the wind and we can all work together. That's, you know, that's the first group that I was thinking of, you know, and the <clears> other <throat> thing I was thinking of, what about you guys reaching out to disabled vets, to um, fatherless boys, there's many, many different groups throughout the country. I'm involved mm -hmm. with fathers in the field um, and of mountains of men. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing later today. Uh, outdoor initiatives. I talked with uh, Brittany French. She's the CEO of uh, Pass It On Outdoor Mentors. There's a lot of these groups. Now, are you working with any of these groups to help get the word out to do the three R's? Um, in Michigan, we have uh, the wheeling team. It's a 457 wheeling team. Ray Brown is the president. He's, he's a, a Marine a retired Marine, he's the president, disabled, and they have a group where they take, they have, uh, what goes it? they got, uh, I think, eight track chairs that they take unbelievable amount of people out hunting that's disabled. They take them out rabbit hunting, goose hunting, duck hunting, pheasant hunting, deer hunting, squirrel hunting, everything in these track chairs. And yeah, the, I'm working with the wheeling team, 457 wheeling team in Michigan. And I, I would like to work with more organizations like you're talking about also to get the word out there because this is very important to Michigan's economy it's very important to Michigan's hunting heritage that we have pheasant hunting in Michigan again and I would be I'm working every year on making the program better and I'm so blessed in this organization that God has blessed me so much nobody in our organization gets paid a dime including me I don't get a dime for nothing and I don't want no money. I told him my reward is smiles for miles. When I see people pheasant hunting, it just makes me just bust out happy. And also the people that God has brought into my life, it's, it's unbelievable. Highly educated men that will not take a dime, that will do anything they can to make this program a success. 
Carl Griffin, Jack Ammerman, Brad Brunken. He was in charge of global sales for General Motors. He's on our team. He was pheasants forever. He crossed the line and came over because he wanted to be able to take his grandchildren pheasant hunting. And unfortunately, last year we lost him. He passed away and it put a big hole in my heart because he worked so hard for this program and, and many other people. I, I'm not mentioning everybody's names, but think about it. With the guidance of the Lord, bringing all these people into my life to help this program, we have a, a reputation in Lansing that don't mess with the MPHI guys. They have alligator skin because we don't back down. We know what we have to do to make this program, program a success, and we will continue to do that. And the DNR, and we have Adam Bump, is in, he's, he's been in meetings with us with MUCC. And hats off to Adam. He's been very cooperative and he's working with us to get more release sites, but it all hinges on funding. And until we get more and more money, uh, we'll be thankful and happy for where we're at right now in this time and day. And now we're a 5013C. At, at one time, I didn't have that status. Now we have that status and, and we just keep marching forward. And that's what we're going to do. So if somebody wants to get a hold of you, give you a couple bucks um donate their farm put in conservation easement or whatever you know because god works in his ways his timing mysterious ways if you will mm -hmm. and he owns everything cows on a thousand hills yeah so it's never about the money i learned that a long time ago nope. in my own personal life it's never about the money it's about your passion, your desire, your willing to serve. Um, that's why I'm involved with Fathers in the Field and helping out through my podcast, these other fatherless organizations that I want to see more and more boys get in the outdoors, whatever it would be, canoeing, hiking, fishing. I took my uh, my little buddy, uh, Fly fishing. For the first time, he went fly fishing. And we were on private water, not public water. So mm -hmm. it was just it was a circus, you know. And he just caught fish after fish. And he learned so much about finding fish and presentation and doing all that, you know, in, in let's call it three hours than he would if he had to fish public water. Right. And it's just, just amazing that I can invest in this kid's life. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're out there, especially moms, if you're a single mom, there's an organization near you. Just Google it. You know, groups that serve fatherless boys. And when I think about your group and what you're doing, it, it would be wonderful if somehow somebody would man up and say, hey, I'll I'll run that department or division of our group and I'll make sure that we take out fatherless boys on a consistent basis. You know, that would be wonderful to see. And that isn't your mission today, but tomorrow it could be because we talked about the three R's and across the country, I represent 58 years of hunting. Mm -hmm. my kids hunt somewhat but they don't hunt like I used to hunt and still do I'm going turkey hunting in a couple of weeks in Wisconsin uh, because I love it it's my passion and so I want to see and that's one reason Hutch on Hunting exists because people say you know I want to find out more about hunting Colorado or Michigan or Iowa, because my guests are from all over the country. And so they can say, huh, how do I get a hold of that guy? So saying that, how does somebody get a hold of you, Ken? Okay, and the way they can get a hold of us is they can look look us up on the Michigan Pheasant Hunting Initiative Facebook page or www.mphi.info. And they can, they can contact us that way or also... My daughter said I'm crazy for doing this, but I said I haven't been threatened with anybody yet. I get my phone number out, 810-358-9372. 
And believe it or not, I've had people call me from all over the United States. They are very interested in what is happening in Michigan. We have hunters coming from many other states to hunt Michigan now. And they, they were very happy to be coming into our state, supporting our local economy. I had an attorney call me one time from South Carolina and said, Ken, how in the world did you pull this off? And I told him <laughs> he wanted it in his state too. Other people wanted it. And uh, I mean, like I saw a video, I don't know if you've ever heard of McFarland Pheasant Farms in Wisconsin, the biggest pheasant farm in, in the world. They sell millions of birds. They showed a video of a semi truck loaded with pheasants heading to Wisconsin or Wyoming of all places and said, these birds will be there ready in the morning to release in Wyoming for the hunters. Birds are being released all over the United States. And now I'm happy to say that Michigan is doing the same thing. We're not, we don't have the biggest program, but it's one of the most successful programs out there because it happened. Well, because of you, and I know you're a humble guy, but it takes that one person to say, here I am, God, send me. Mm -hmm. We're both men of faith, so I can say that. And, you know, if, it, if that bugs a listener, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, just turn me off. <laughs> well, I was, uh, it's I, was in Lansing. I was in Lansing, and uh, God spoke to me and told me that he opened a door that no man can close. And you know, God can open doors and close doors. And every time I would think I was at the end of the road, another door would open and I would walk through it in faith. And each time I would walk through it, some, it never was a disappointment. It just kept happening and happening and happening. And I gave an example one time of God's mercy and grace. We were broke, financially broke. Didn't know what we were going to do. The pheasant season would have been a total disaster if it had not been for this one thing. We put an article in Outdoor News, Michigan Outdoor News, that if we didn't get an angel with deep pockets, we wasn't going to make it. A man named Alex Beecham called me on my phone. I never looked him in the eyeball one time in my life. He said, Ken, I'm Alex Beecham, and I'm a sinner. I'm going, why is he telling me he's a sinner? I said, Alex, I'm a born-again Christian. I serve the Lord. What's up with you? He said, I got saved, and I'm your angel with deep pockets. How much money, Ken, do you want? And I said, let me pray. I bowed my head in prayer, come back, negotiate it. He gave us $25,000. He bought 1,700 more roosters to put on the ground that fall for Michigan's pheasant hunters. And his mother passed away with lung cancer, which he loved dearly. And he wanted to have an honor, honorable hunt for her because it was during COVID and he couldn't give her a proper funeral and her burial. And so we honored her. Through, I would see hunters in the fields. I said, will you shoot a pheasant for Alex's mom? They said, we got you. So they were honoring Alex's mother in the field. And then it was just it was just amazing. Think about it. $25,000 just doesn't fall out of, you know. Yes, it does. It was at the right time. The yes, right it place. does, though. You know that. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. yeah. And, and we had that money. And the, I think the program, God knew we needed it at that moment, or the program would have just almost crashed and burned but then that kept us going forward but he and, knew uh, the guy and yeah. he spoke to the guy said make mm -hmm. the phone call he made the phone yeah. call wrote you to the chat yeah and folks that i don't know if you know god know what he does i'm alive because of him but he also knows that he knows what's best for you his timing is perfect so if you're frustrated right now, said things aren't going so well and the economy, don't watch the news. Please turn off the news. But you have what they call blessed assurance through the Lord Jesus Christ, period. And since I went with uh, Ken and he and I talked post-show, that we were going to talk about God on the show because people are hurting today. And one thing Hutch and Hunting is going to do is one, give people Thank you. the information about hunting Colorado, hunting Michigan, hunting Iowa, wherever. But more than that, how to serve the fatherless. More than that, how to get involved in people's lives so you can make a difference. You might be the only person yeah. 
that can make a difference. So when that time comes, as we see in Colorado, cowboy up, open your mouth, and do what you need to do. Your thoughts, Ken? I absolutely agree with that. Um, this is this is something that I take very serious when I, I notice uh, a lot of young men and, and, and young children, girls and boys, they don't have a mentor in their life. And everybody has an attitude like, ah, uh, oh, they don't want to go hunting. They just want to play on computers. They want to sit in the house and watch TV. I disagree with that. I believe that if somebody would come into their life and introduce them to the shooting sports and the hunting and the fishing, it, it could change their life forever and give them something to look forward to. I'll give you an example. There's this uh, young kid. He's, uh, I think, uh, 13, 13 years old. Uh, his father's not in his life. And uh, I was uh, got to know the family really well. And I took him pheasant hunting. And we had a, a fundraiser hunt at Rooster Ranch in, Mich in Michigan in the thumb to raise some money for our organization. And I took him. He says, now I have something to look forward to in my life. Now he loves pheasant hunting. He's going to get a bird dog. I see that kid when he gets his driver's license, getting a bird dog, getting a pickup truck, a dog box, and a shotgun, and throwing his friends in there with him. <laughs> they will be hunters because of that day. Yeah. He, he is. I laugh oh, at is. that. Oh, it's at 20%. But back yeah. in the day, I mean, I always had either shotgun or my rifle in my truck. Mm -hmm. And I had Alex sitting beside me. And I would go to work. That's how I'd go to work. I'd be dressed up and I'd go past. I remember a couple of different times we lived near the Wisconsin River, Wausau, Wisconsin. So I had Alex with me. And then I'd have my waders or hip boots in the back. And I'd kind of take some detours going to my appointments and checking out potholes or you know small ponds mm -hmm. and so i said huh there's a mallard sitting there okay after after the thing i knew how to get in there and you know we changed clothes and sometimes i wouldn't even <laughs> i just put on my waders grab my shotgun get alex put him on a leash and and we get him and we'd bust the ducks and i'd knock a duck down or two and Alex would go get him and I get home and my wife said how did they go I said it was fantastic it's, it's some ducks I gotta clean <laughs> what did you make us any money I said um uh, I don't remember <laughs> my but that's the way here. life was oh yeah good old days no it, that's just that was in the 70s in Wausau Wisconsin mm -hmm. and uh I had a Jeep Wagoneer. I didn't have a truck. I had a Jeep Wagoneer, but it doesn't matter. I had a gun rack and and that's what that's just what we did. Or we went fly fishing. And uh yeah, it's just the outdoors has been an unbelievable blessing to me. As you can see behind me, I got a turkey fan and I got a, yeah. a wolf hide out of British Columbia. And folks I didn't make a lot of money. I made some money, but I didn't make a lot of money, but I decided the things that are important to me to support. So I'm a life member named the conservation group. And there you go. Uh, set on a couple boards, so forth and so on. But I made a decision to make a difference in the North American model of wildlife conservation, which is under attack brutally. Mm -hmm. And the stupid guys, I don't know why they did this in, up in Wyoming, uh, that little town they took, the guy hit it with a snowmobile and brought him into a bar in Daniels, Wyoming, this incredibly stupidity of a human being. You know, I just don't know why they're doing it. So, the reason I bring that up is we have to fight for our hunting tradition. And one way you can fight is support people like Ken and his organization and just pick one. If you got five bucks, fine. If you got more than that, fine. Or get involved and volunteer and help make the organization successful. Your thoughts on that? 
Um, I, I think that's very important that we support each other. And we have to also, as hunters, be uh, use wisdom. We need to be um, aware of that there are people out there that are watching every move that we're making. And we don't need to be doing anything that brings hunting down. We need to do things that is positive um, because they need they don't need very many excuses to uh, try to try to stop this. What we love to do. I mean, everything is under attack in this country, but um, it's very important what, what, what you were saying that we need to be more uh, tentative to what we're doing and and fight for what's right. And you you just can't like in Michigan we lost our dove hunting season. It could have very well happened, but so many hunters, including my own brother, he voted no because he said they just love to sit on his bird feeder. I said, Jeff, they're shooting them in every state around Michigan, and they're great table fare. People love to eat them, and most of them die from natural causes more than we ever harvest. But he yet voted no for the dove season. And that really bothers me because if you don't even know this, this could have been a number one hunter recruitment tool in Michigan, taking people out, setting in a wheat field, a corn field, and with some pizza and some cold drinks, and you could have taken even the young kids out there to point a BB gun at them that would never shot one, but they would have thought they were hunting. And that would have increased hunter numbers also in the small game hunting field, but we lost that opportunity. In Michigan, you can't even hunt sandhill cranes, and they're just overpopulating like crazy, but in other states, you can harvest sandhill cranes. Why, why these things are happening, I don't know, but I don't like it. Yeah, it's Sand Hill Crane's tenderloin of the air. And mm -hmm. I have never shot one. My buddies invited me a couple of different times to go. I just never have. But they said, Bruce, the meat is just like tenderloin of the air. It's just fabulous, fabulous table fare. Yeah, they call. I heard it was called a ribeye of the sky also. Okay. And uh, I know a friend of mine had some one time and he was having a barbecue down in uh, – uh, Bloomfield, uh, Birmingham, Michigan, or Bloomfield Hills, and they there's some uh, pretty up the up people hanging out there at this barbecue, and they're going, "Oh, this is delicious, Chad. What is it? It's Sandhill Crane." <laughs> <laughs> they almost started puking, <laughs> but they liked it before they heard the word. <laughs> well, yeah, I would have said, "Hey, it's just ribeye, just ribeye." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> told them the rest later, <laughs> but yeah, we're uh, you know. My brother Terry, when we was when I was really heavily into this program, we're driving down the road. He says, "Would you just shut up talking about pheasants? You're driving me crazy." <laughs> I said, "I'm in a war. Don't interrupt it." <laughs> 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 and it took a lot, you know. But I, I want everybody to know that God first is is my main drivetrain. But all the people that support me and back me are tremendous help, and I'll never forget these people. They're special to me in my heart. Without them, I'm so untech savvy. I can't do hardly nothing, but they've got my back. Well, sure. Um, well, you did a good job. Your daughter did a good job setting you up today for the podcast. She, she's so special. Jackie, yeah. are you there? Yeah, hi. So come and stand behind your dad. Oh, come on, Jackie. I just come on, come on. <laughs> Uh, she was reading her Bible. She just was reading her Bible. Okay. Just stand behind your dad. Come on. <laughs> Get over here, Say Jackie. hi. Hi. Say how proud you are of your dad. I'm very proud. He's very determined. <laughs> oh, you think? Oh, I know. When he goes all in on something, he goes all in. Well, that's that's a nice dad to have. And, and so you're blessed that, one, he knows who his father is. And he's just going to train you up as you should go. Yeah, so we have a pretty unique story. Do you mind if I share? Do we got time? No, no, please. Okay. So um, my mom passed away when I was two. So my dad, you know, got kind of dealt a really rough card. I was two. My sister was four. My brother was seven. My sister had Down syndrome. She passed away from COVID in, 20, in 2021. But um, prior to her passing, you know, you really can't say, you can't judge somebody on how they live their life if you never walk through it, you know? Right. So my dad, he he was just, were you angry with God? Is that why things were the way they were growing up? Or No. He, well, he just wasn't really serving God, you know? 
and things were hard for him. Well, um, we lived a pretty crazy life back then before Jesus. And um, so I ended up kind of turning to things I shouldn't, you know, growing up as a teenage girl and life was just hard without a mom. Well, I got saved when I was like 26. Wow. And I started, pray I started praying for my dad and uh, about for three months, I prayed for my dad and he, he called me up one day and he said, uh, can I ask you something? I said, yeah, what's that? And he said, um, can you forgive me for how things were when you guys were kids? And I said, yeah. He said, I asked Jesus to forgive me too. And I'm ready to live for him again. I'm ready to serve him again. And from that moment on, like God just restored our whole relationship, you know, like Isn't growing up, I, I was really rebellious, you know, things were crazy sure. and now he's my best friend. <laughs> so really grateful for that. That's the redemption power of Christ. He can restore any situation, any relationship, and he wants to do that. So listeners, if you got broken relationship in the family, restore it. Man up. I just had to call a guy that I took a fishing trip with last year, and he said he really didn't notice anything, but it was really hard for me because I'm disabled vet. We'll leave that to another time, but I have anxiety issues. And so I had to turn over. He was driving younger than I am. So he's driving from Colorado to San Diego where we're going fishing. And he didn't stop at the places I usually stop. And it was just, it was strange for me because I had to release control. And I didn't have the tools and I'm getting the tools because I'm in, in therapy for the anxiety, but I gave, I am getting the tools. So talking to my therapist this week and she said, and I used that experience and she didn't say you should call him, but I immediately, when I got out of the session, got in my truck, I called him and said, Hey, Jerry, I'm calling for forgiveness. And he says, what? what are you talking about? I said, you know, we went and you told me to buy this book and I couldn't find the bookstore in San Diego. And, and you know, I, I was behaving badly. I was very anxious and it just wasn't a good scene. He says, I don't remember. Well, probably knowing Jerry, he did. He remembered, but it wasn't important to him. So no matter where you're at, listeners, if there's somebody that keeps popping up in your brain that you need to have a talk with your kids, your boss, your wife, your ex-wife, I don't know what it is. One, think about it. Two, pray about it. And three, dial the number. Because forgiveness is the greatest gift that Christ can give you he forgives you of our trespasses of our sins he forgives us uh -huh. nobody else can do that they can say the words as i just said but he can do that and once you let that into your heart and soul you are free free indeed and nobody can take that from you you own that you're saved by the blood of the lamb. Wow, this is this is interesting today. I don't know where it was going. I, I knew <laughs> because your background, we'd get some of this. But do that, and you'll be freer than you've ever been. I don't care if you're an addict. I don't, I, I, it doesn't matter, because guess what? Christ doesn't matter. He's already forgiven you, but you have to open up redemption and restoration. <laughs> Thoughts on that? That's beautiful. So true. <laughs> and these are yeah, the stories. To... These are the stories that are going to come out in Hutch and Hunting. And the reason I do it, because it's my job to do the podcast. The increase 
the delivery, whose ear it hurt, hears, is not under my control. My control is to publish this and throw it out there and see what it'll do. Amen. Plant the seeds and help make it grow, right? Well, on good soil. <laughs> we did see how it goes, but thank you so much for sharing, Jackie. That's a great, great story of a daughter that never <laughs> gave up on her dad and loves him today because you guys been through it, but here you are. Well, we all, we also, um, we lost, uh, lost our, her brother and my son a year later from a drug overdose. After my sister, after passed her sister away. passed, you know, but in the, in the, in the scriptures, it tells us that he gives us the peace that passes all understanding. And when Jessica passed away, it was like I was wrapped in spiritual bubble wrap. I was so at peace that people thought I was mentally disturbed. Uh, I knew Jessica was in heaven in a better place, and I accepted that. And I and, and used it as a testimony uh, that her life was so special and that she touched so many lives. There was over 200 people at her funeral. And even the people that worked in the funeral home wanted to set in on the on the funeral because the Holy Spirit was there so strong. And at the gravesite, uh, I had everybody give the Lord a clap offering for taking her to heaven. And to this day, I still have peace in my heart after my daughter died. And it, it just looks different, you know, when you have that that hope and when you are certain in your heart. It just looks it looks different. Like people couldn't even believe it. Like we had party hats, we had, you know, a celebration. Well, yeah. Why it wasn't not? A She's not suffering you know? anymore. Yeah. And like I had in so many people we've invited to church and they didn't go to church, but we brought church, we brought church to that funeral for sure. There you go. <laughs> we had worship music. We had, I mean, it was just the most beautiful funeral I've ever seen in my life. That's it shocked me. Cool. It shocked people. The, they came. They were just amazed that at the power of God that was at her funeral. I mean, we're running out of time now, guys. We got about okay. five minutes to go. So, okay. how do you want to wrap this up, Ken? Well, thanks for having me. I'll let you have it. Sure, back. Jackie. Yeah. Thank you. Well, got a lot more ground to cover here with this program in Michigan right now. There's a place called Sharonville that's in uh, southern lower Michigan that they're crying out for pheasant hunting also. They have about 6,000 acres, and um, it, it's all around funding. Uh, we was hoping that if we could raise enough money to maybe buy three to 500 more roosters to open up that site until we get you know more license sales. If anybody would ever consider donating for something like that, that would be fantastic. Um, what would that so, cost? Yeah. What's a number? Give me a number. Well, um, the birds are like around $24 a piece. So figure that out at 500 birds or 300, whatever would be grateful. But that would probably put another thousand of people to buy another thousand licenses. That would be fantastic to put that many people back in the fields again, you know. Um, it's not, it's not a staggering amount of money. Organization that's not uh, financially driven, but uh, I'm very thankful. We, we are a totally different organization because we have an unbelievable amount of money in the sub account, <laughs> you know, that, that's under the control of the DNR. So we can't get all this money released like we want to get the birds. So, uh, an example, when Alex Beecham donated the $25,000, the DNR didn't even want to take the money. He told them, he says, it's now or never. If you don't take this money, you're not getting it. Well, they let him write the check to the Michigan Game Bird Breeders Association, and, and then they put the birds out like that. So uh, we'd like we'd like to open up another another site, you know, at least one. I'd be thankful for that if, if something could happen. Um, what would be maybe like, a, how much would you think that'd be, Bruce? I'm not got that number in my head. But, What's that? Uh, 300 times 24 dollars what would that be that's 60 grand 60 yeah round figures mm -hmm. yeah something like that yeah or even 200 birds you know whatever you know 
anything just to get the ball rolling more, you know? So the money that's in that sub account is frozen. So you can't use that for expansion. That's just to maintain what you have. Is that? Well, yeah, that, the money is locked up in the sub account for the exclusive release of rooster pheasants only, but we're only be able to, to draw so much a year out of there for each year for the program till we get more licenses sold to get bigger, to make the next move. Right. But if we get a donation, uh, to get purchase some more birds and that that's fine too you know so All right we just so, pray about it so how do, one more time how do people contact you if whoever's hearing this says i'll throw in 10 grand mm -hmm. so how do they okay. do that they, they can call me personally at 810-358-9372 it's ken dalton or they can go to the www.mphi.info, our website, or reach out on Facebook to us. And then we, we will get promptly back with uh, whoever calls us. And that would be beautiful. Well, Ken, this is this has been a joy. And I laugh because it's just, I'm amazed at the people I run into. And, and it seems Hutch on Hunting is helping people grow they're not their business. I, I'm trying to think their mission. It's more than a business. It's it's their mission. This is what they're doing. Just like fathers in the field and a mountains of men and passing on outdoor mentors, uh, giving it back outdoors. Um, all these groups are doing one thing that I mentioned in the investing in the lives of young men. And so- mm -hmm. If you got a couple hours a month, think about investing that into a life of a young man that doesn't have a father. And that'll change your life. This is Hutch on Hunting saying thanks so much for listening. And I'll talk to you real soon.